Welcome to the Monster Scene Period. The Monster Scene Period comes after the Revolta Scene, lasting from 141 million years to 175 million years into the planet's history. This period is best known for the expansion of several clades of animals into new niches, creating truly bizarre and nightmarish experiments of evolution. The monster scene is similar to the Triassic period of Earth, due to both being periods where natural selection produced an array of animal life we would call weird. This is how the continents have looked throughout the monster scene. Can Mapuas continue to drift towards Barros and begun to separate from North Lyrusa, which has become dotted with rivers that support stretches of swamps or rainforests? Although they first appeared as small and unassuming lizard-like animals, the Squall's horse began to hit their stride in the monster scene, with their light build offering them plenty of freedom to expand into vacant niches. As such, although basal forms remained common, ancient Squallosaur families like the Gigging Nathids continued to diversify, and new ones, such as the Carcarophonids, began to evolve to fill the niches of megafaunal carnivores. Squalosaurs became more diverse in the monster scene, with species like Mushu Murphyi developing an elongated, sinewy body similar to those of weasels. The animal was a fierce carnivore specialized for hunting burrowing prey, like small salachipods and arthropods. If its prey's burrow was big enough, Mushu would claim it as its own and use it as a shelter before vacating in two days. As such, it was a nomadic species and very frequently found itself in a variety of habitats. Mushu Murphy I could grow to three feet long, making it one of the larger of the smaller species of monstrosine squalosaurs around this time. Mushu pups were born at only three inches in length before eventually reaching adult size. Another species of squalosaur optimized for a life spent in the water. Foley's Carcarodile was a semi-aquatic ambush predator that redeveloped a thin tail to make it a better swimmer. It lunged at any large enough herbivore unlucky enough to take a drink in its territory. Its morphology is actually quite common among Earth animals that live in this manner, as the extinct Timmons bundles, Phytosaurs, and early whale ancestors all converged upon a crocodilian-esque body shape. Foley's Carcarodile was one of the largest squalosaurs to live around this time period, reaching up to 8 feet in length, rivaling most cane species on Earth. Its eggs were laid in clutches that were protected by the mother before hatching to reveal 7 inch long pups. Other types of squalosaur took a more radical direction. Carcarophonius cristatus, named for the array of tentacles on the back of the head was a large species that developed a more erect posture and a gracile build for fast running. The Squalosaur also became a facultative biped, meaning they could run on two legs for a time to make it faster and free up its powerful forelimbs to aid in grappling with large prey, such as Carcarothers. Carcarophonius also had an incredible bite force. Carcarophonius cristatus while larger than its more lizard-like ancestors, was still relatively small at around 44 inches high at the shoulder, or about as tall as a Shetland pony. The pups of the squirrels were averaged around 9 inches long, or as heavy as long as an average house cat. Guiding Nathans, while still in their infancy, remained efficient predators even with the advent of such fierce rivals as Carcarophonius and the Carcarodile. Rhodogagonathus Ironia remains similar to Revoltacene stock like Phobodins, albeit bulkier with a larger head and a shorter tail. It was a generalist that could take down just about any quarry smaller than itself. Much like earlier forms, it was also content to scavenge and feed on carrion when the opportunity presented itself. Protogagonathus Ironia was among the larger terrestrial squalosaur stock at the time reaching a little over five feet in body length, or about as long as its Earth analog, the spotted hyena. Its pups were relatively tiny at seven inches upon hatching. 
not to be outdone by their distant squalls to her cousins. Karkarathirs also experienced a wave of diversity during the Moshasane period. Some remained similar to stuff in the Revoltocene period, while others took up new and more varied ways of life. One group would eventually develop into clades such as the Flumethirs and Caprasqualians, both of whom would become monumentally important to later into Squalosia's history. Some Karkarathir species remained basal in overall anatomy, such as Thyreorhinus and Lystrodins. This animal was a plant eater that subsisted on tough vegetation like plant roots or tree bark, stripping it with the aid of a pair of tusks. The skull of Thyreorhinus bore protrusions that allowed the Karkarathir to recognize members of its own species during courtship. The bumps are an ontogenetic feature that are absent in newborn calves and grow larger as the animal ages. Thyreorhinus lystrodins can measure 13 feet in body length, making it similar in size to a white rhinoceros and one of the largest plant eaters in the Mostracine. The calves of this basal Karkarathir hatch at only 11 inches in length. The first Flumetheres were similar to other Karkarathirs in basic body shape, but more adapted for aquatic life. Hippopotamomimus natins came to resemble its namesake in developing tusks similar to those of Thyreorhinus and a similar body shape. It also underwent an atavism of the dorsal and caudal fins, allowing it to become more maneuverable in the water. While mostly an herbivore, the Flumetheer supplemented its diet with small sharks. Its territory overlapped with that of the Carcharodile. The maximum length of Hippopotamus minus natins was around 16 and a half feet long, rivaling its hippo namesake despite being lighter by a few kilograms. Hippopotamus minus calves were also around the same size as their namesakes on Earth. The Caprasqualians were a clade of Carcarathir sharing a common ancestor with Flumetheres, becoming lighter at build. Barayo's Hornhead, shout out to subscriber Catherine Barayo, was a basal species that browsed on the leaves of bushes and small trees. Its name comes from the brow horns on its head, which are more prominent in males, who use them in courtship displays. Like many herbivores of the time, horned heads lived in small herds. They were important prey items of Carcarophonius and other carnivores. Barayo's horned head was small for a Carcarothere, only growing as large as a common muntjac or around three feet on average. Male whoreheads were slightly larger than females, although their calves were consistently around four inches long upon hatching. While nowhere near as prolific as neonicopods, or the clade containing squalosaurs and carcarotheres, the chelococcarids underwent some diversification of their own and held on wherever they could. Although some species died out or were in danger of extinction, the clade as a whole will continue to play a role in Squalosian history, however minor it may be. One species of Chelocarcharid, a descendant of the revolting taxon Lepidopelta, further developed its back scutes into a array of defensive plates. Porcopelta malacaventris was a grazer that lived in small herds for protection. Unlike Carcarotheres, Porcopelta lacked the skeletal fortitude necessary to reach large sizes out of the water, and as such, remained small. Its most glaring weakness was its soft underbelly, which predators could access by flipping the animal on its back. Due to the more basal and less reinforced skeletal structure shared by most Kilocarcharids, Porcopelta malacaventris could reach only about four feet in length, making it one of the smaller herbivores of its day. Its calves hatched with undeveloped armor at only six inches long. Another descendant of Lepidopelta took the opposite direction, becoming more specialized for life in fresh water and producing the first secondarily aquatic salagopod. The squality is developed adaptations similar to manatees or dugongs, including a paddle-like tail for swimming and a prehensile upper lip to better handle food. Its lips have become so sensitive to touch that its barbels have become obsolete and atrophied. Squalities are oviparous and give live birth. Squalities grew within size ranges comparable to those of manatees, namely 9 to 10 feet from snout to tail, 
as their body mass can be supported more easily in the water due to buoyancy counteracting gravity. Their calves were born at around four feet long and can see a tail first to prevent them from drowning. Many invertebrates, especially arthropods and mollusks, exploded into diversity as the Washington period progressed. Clays like the razor whip moths, spiders, and isopods began to fill every imaginable niche available to them on land, while others like cephalopods and jellyfish came to dominate the oceans. Other clays found refuge in bios like the fruitful jungle, as we'll discuss in a future episode. One clade of razor whip moths made the transition from predator to parasite, as larger and larger salachopods became more abundant becoming the Vampiro Papillonines, or Helsing Moths. The red-capped Helsing Moth was a fairly typical species, bearing reduced raptorial spikes on its forelegs and repurposing its proboscis to drink blood instead of drain the life out of prey. Helsing Moths also take good care of their young, rearing them in burrows and feeding them a liquid diet of regurgitated blood. Red cat Helsing moths can reach an adult size of a little over an inch in length, or as long as a crane fly. While small compared to its predatory relatives, the moth's tiny frame allows it to feed more stealthily from its hosts. Its eggs hatch to reveal caterpillars that are only about a tenth of the size of their parents. Even as other invertebrates like the razorwood moths and onychobracket spiders thrived, more basal species continue to exist. The luminous hypnospider evolved to host bioluminescent bacteria in its gut to suit a nocturnal lifestyle. By flashing its abdominal stripes in an oscillating display, the spider could attract prey in a manner similar to a codfish on Earth. The organisms lived in a symbiotic relationship, with the bacteria helping the spider hunt in return for being sustained by its kills. The luminous hypno spider reached a leg span comparable to that of a Sydney funnel web spider, averaging at around 6 or 7 centimeters and maxing out at 8. Spiderlings only bore a small population of their glowing bacterial symbiotes and were born the size of a sunflower seed. Another invertebrate clay to benefit from the Moschacene period was the isopods, some of which would come to resemble long extinct trilobites. Aptly named Neotrilobites, or more specifically the family Neotrilobidae, they became extremely diverse and gave rise to thousands of species, somewhat like beetles on Earth. The muddy Neotrilobite was a fairly standard species that lived much like earlier isopods, scavenging on dead organic matter. Its brown shell blended into the mud of its habitat. The muddy Neotrilobite could reach up to four inches in length, making it similar in size to a large lime. While species from the Eutavolocene and Terranocene were among the most gargantuan, the Neotrilobite was still fairly large for an isopod. Baby Neotrilobites were about a fifth of an inch long when newly born. One lineage of squid, the Teratotuthids, arose in the late Revoltocene before becoming aquatic apex predators in the Mostracene. The Squalosian Kraken was the largest of these behemoths, and the largest invertebrate to ever evolve on Squalosia. Its spiked tentacles were used to hook onto gigantic prey like Euhemocillian sharks and even smaller gigantic cephalopods. Despite its massive size, the Kraken was deceptively fast, clocking in at speeds of 40 miles per hour. Like its mythological namesake and flies, the Squalosian Kraken was a truly gigantic beast. It could reach up to 60 feet in length, counting its tentacles, and weighed in at about 7 tons, which is exceedingly heavy for a cephalopod. Baby Krakens were around a foot long upon hatching, and mainly hunted smaller prey. Rapientozoans continued to diversify throughout the Mostracean period, with such species as the Devil Sea Snatcher making themselves at home in tropical waters. Like other rapientozoans, the sea snatcher replied on its venomous tentacles to catch prey while it sat unmoving on rocks. A sting from a single sea snatcher could administer enough venom to kill something as large as a great white shark in a matter of minutes. For anything smaller, 
This meant instant death. The Devil Sea Snatcher bore a bell that could reach up to 8 inches in length and weighed 150 grams, putting it on the smaller side of marine fauna despite being one of the largest species of Repientozoan. Like its ancestor, proto the Sea Snatcher's plectonic larvae bordered on microscopic sizes. Many of the plant species that developed in the Revoltocene produced descendants similar to them in size and morphology, but now nearly as diverse as the animal life it supported. Even carnivorous plant taxons started to evolve in the Mostracene. North Myrusian rainforests have grown and become distinct enough for the more deciduous forests on the same continent, as well as those present on Kanmapu, to be considered their own unique biome, the fruitful jungle. This bountiful rainforest of pepper and kiwi descendants contains a menagerie of flora and fauna found nowhere else on Squalosia and dependent on one another for survival. The Neonicopods remain the dominant land animals of the Mastracene, although Chelicarcharids began to find niches of their own to fill in the ecosystem, which has become the most unstable it has ever been since the Nuova scene. Thus, the latopods continue to rule for more than them and arthropods like Helsing balls to feed on them as parasites. Although invertebrates in the water, like Teratatuthids and Repientozoans, had it much easier because of their larger sizes compared to many Euhemocillian species. Especially ecologically diverse habitats like the tropical floodplains and fruit and jungle have arisen to support the growing animal community. This video doesn't detail everything about the monster scene only the aspects and creatures most relevant to the planet's history. If you don't understand what I just showed you all, you can always access the Google Doc, Sporecast, or Discord for the projects for more detailed information. The links are posted in the description. As always, if you have any questions pertaining to the project, I will gladly answer them to the best of my ability in the comments section. On the next episode, We'll learn more about the fruitful jungle of the Monster Sea, where many forms of animal life have blossomed to further diversity than can be seen anywhere else in the period. I will see you all later. Good night, and Happy Halloween! <laughs>